Welcome to the live stream. Today, we're going over some government jobs and usajobs.gov questions and answers in order to help get you a government job quicker. So I'm going to be reading some questions that were previously submitted. And then after that, I'll look in the chat and see if there's any questions there. Let's get started with the first one. First question is from Kimberly Joss Good, who asks, I would love to eventually switch to a field like human resources. I have little experience in an unrelated degree. How can one make the transition? Okay, so human resources falls under the 0200 job series. Now, 0201 is human resource management. 0203 is HR assistant. So you're probably going to want to look at the 0203 job series. And most of these positions are between GS4 and GS9. So you're not going to find a lot of the higher grades in this series. Also, you need to read the entire job announcement. A lot of these positions, they're going to mention they want 12 months of clerical experience. So they're not looking for legitimate, truly pure human resource experience. This could be office work. So you can be eligible and qualify on that experience. Now, it's really difficult for a lot of these people uh, once they get into the higher GS grades, like GS 12, GS 13, and then they want to make the switch to HR. A lot of times that's that's pretty hard. Now, if you're already in the government and you're already receiving, you know, if you're getting a, a higher salary, maybe you should look around at different job series that you qualify for. A lot of people are qualified for multiple job series and they're not quite sure where their experience lines up. So I would encourage you to look on the OPM job series handbook, look through there and find some of the other job series that you could be qualified for if you have like a certain salary requirement. Okay. Next question is from David Rodriguez PR, who asks, I was told GS employees cannot use TRICARE. Is this true? What options do we have if we're planning to use VA as retirees? So this is a military retiree. If you are a military retiree, you can use TRICARE. And I know this because I use TRICARE. I'm a military retiree. And the way that this works is once you get into the federal government, you can decline their health benefit. Now, they offer health, they also offer dental, and they also offer vision. So what I did is I accepted dental because for TRICARE, looking at what the, the military retiree is offered for dental is very comparable to the government. But the health insurance, TRICARE is a lot cheaper. TRICARE for retirees for a family is $600 a year, something like that. Now, in the government, as a government employee, it's going to be more than that. So I would go with TRICARE. It also depends on what type of medical clinics or facilities are near you. Where I'm at, there's a, there's a military base, which you can always go to, a military base probably 20 minutes from here. And then there's an actual TRICARE clinic 15 minutes from here. So I go to you know either one of those. Now, in the clinic, it's more for retirees. But every now and again, you'll see somebody come in in uniform. And if somebody comes in in uniform, they're going to have priority. So you're not the priority. The, the, the service members in, in uniform are priority. All right. Let's see. Hey, Bobcat Stillwell, good morning. I hope you're doing great. Teresa Baldrama, good morning. I hope everyone's doing great. Thanks for joining. All right, let's go. Next question. Next question is from DIY Not 4684. I interviewed for a position on March 20th. When can I reasonably expect a job offer? Okay, there's not a perfect answer to this, right? The answer will always be, it depends. But to give you a rough average, a rough idea, I would say between one and three weeks. Now, there are cases where people get job offers in less than a week. And there's other cases where it takes more than three weeks. It might take longer than a month. But I would say probably about 70% of everybody usually receives it between one and three weeks. This is going to depend on a lot of factors. All right. So most of it is going to depend on HR. All right. It's also going to depend on the office in the agency that you're that you interviewed for. How quick are they trying to get somebody on board? Now, what I would do if you have not heard back in three weeks, I would identify the point of contact, the individual that scheduled your interview, email them, ask them for a status update. There have been cases where after an interview, someone doesn't hear back. And then once they email for the status update, then they could receive a job offer. 
at the minimum, you should receive closure, right? They could say, hey, we canceled this position. We already hired for this position. Or it could trigger HR to send you that tentative job offer. So always check back. But I would give it three weeks. Next question is from David Rodriguez, PR. I will retire from the Army on June of 2025. Can I start applying for federal jobs six months out? Okay, so when you can start applying, my recommendation is once you have the statement of service. And most people have that. The statement of service replaces the DD-214 so you can still claim veterans' preference. So with the statement of service, usually that's signed by your commander, your first 05 in your chain of command, and it is usually 120 days before you're discharged. That's four months. Now, what I have told people in the past and what I did personally is I adjusted that date to when I start permissive TDY. If you have permissive TDY, which you should, once you go, once you're on permissive TDY, a lot of military service members can start working. So if your 05 commander is comfortable with putting that as the date, have that statement of service signed, upload it onto usajobs.gov, use it as the DD-214 to claim veteran's preference, and then you know, move out that way. He also asked, can a person sell back 20 years of active duty time and work 10 years as a federal government employee and retire from federal service with 30 years? Yeah, you can do that. It's possible, but in most cases, it's not recommended because you already have, after 20 years, you have a military retirement. So for most people, it will not make sense to buy back those 20 years. It's going to be expensive. And then the way that I would look at it is you have the retirement for the military. If you just do five more, if you do five years as a federal government employee, you will be fully vested in a pension. And then that pension can be withdrawn. You can start collecting that pension at the age of 62. Now, if you want it earlier, do 10 years in the federal government. You do 10 years in the federal government, and most people retire, they're eligible to retire at 57. So that's the minimum age for most individuals that were born, I believe in 1970 or above, 57. So my recommendation is keep your pension, keep drawing your pension, put five or 10 years, and then you'll be eligible for another pension. A lot of military service members, they receive their military pension. Some of them receive military disability. And then when you're 62, you get Social Security. And then, you know, if you're eligible for um, a federal government pension, you, you receive that as well at 57 or 62. And then on top of that, you, you start to draw, you start to make withdrawals from your TSP, your thrift savings plan at 59 and a half. So we're talking about five streams of revenue that's potential for a lot of these military service members. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Hey, the other day, the other day, talking about applying for applying for government jobs in the military, this there was an individual that he was applying for jobs early, right? He received a job offer just recently, but he was trying to negotiate the start date. And that's something that you can do. You can negotiate start dates. You can also negotiate your step level. So this man, he had a graduation coming up. His daughter was graduating. He wanted to attend that. And then they had a vacation planned after the, the graduation. So the job offer, the tentative start date, which is called the EOD, which is entry on duty, that date was the first week of May. And the graduation was at the end of May and the vacation would take it to June 15th. So he was trying to start on June 15th. He was trying to negotiate a start date of six weeks, a six week difference between when the agency wanted him there and when he wanted to show up. When he responded with this request, HR pulled his job offer. They rescinded it. So he's not eligible for that job offer anymore. And he kind of panicked and he wanted to restart the negotiation, but it was too late. So you have to keep in mind when you are negotiating, whether it's step level or your, your entry date, your start date, or your leave accrual rate, when you are negotiating, there's a time where if you're not going to agree and the agency has other highly qualified candidates waiting then they can pull your job offer. Now, in this circumstance, what I believe he should have done is accepted the date of the first week of May. Once he's a federal government employee and he has a supervisor, he's identified his supervisor, he can talk with that individual 
And they're more accommodating. Most of the time, your supervisor is going to work with you. But he didn't give him he didn't give himself that chance because he was stuck with HR. He was stuck talking to HR, and HR decided, you know what? You're hesitating. I'm going to go ahead and pull it, and we're going to we're going to select another person. So that's something to keep in mind as you're negotiating job offers. All right, let's see. Alaya Jones. Hey, good morning. Hope you're doing great. We have a question from God's favor. Question. Do you know offhand what positions I would qualify for with a teaching degree? I will look at the OPM list that you mentioned earlier. I just need to know in which category to look under. Yes, I do know. So if you're interested in teaching or instructing, the job series for you is 1700. Underneath that job series, you will find instructor positions at a lot of military bases. You'll find teaching positions. You'll also find curriculum development positions. So if you have experience developing curriculum, there's something there for you also. There's also remote positions under there. So I think there's about five or six different series underneath that family, 1700. I would start there. Okay, next question. Claire Hartman. Hi, Armand. Hi, Claire. Thanks for all your videos. You're welcome. I was selected as a PMF uh, fin finalist this year, and I've been applying. And your videos have been so helpful. Well, that's great. I'm glad they. I'm glad that they've been helpful. Hopefully, everything works out with that. Um, thanks for your videos. That's that's great news. Hey, talking about um, talking about that. Let me go ahead and address another question I received the other day. So everyone understands political appointees, right? You have uh, the GS grade right? Non-political. And then you, you even have SESs that are non-political. Those are career SESs, executives. Now, there's another type of position somebody was asking me about the other day. They said, hey, what is a Schedule C? <laughs> and the first thing, when I think about it, you know, a Schedule A is a disabled individual that has non-competitive hiring preference. But what is a Schedule C? A Schedule C is actually a political, it's a political appointee that does not have to be confirmed with the Senate. But they still serve at the pleasure of the president. And every president that comes into office, they usually pick up, they hire about 1,500 individuals under Schedule C. Now, the most common way to get this type of position is that if you help somebody on a political campaign, or if you work for a nonprofit, or something like that. If you do that, then you can probably be positioned to get in. But anybody can apply. You can apply. And the, if you're interested in that, you can go to, uh, if you Google White House, whitehouse.gov political appointee apply. If you Google that, there is a, a website that comes up. It's on the whitehouse.gov website. And through there, you can enter in all your information, attach your resume and submit it. So I think, well, currently right now it's the President Biden's administration. So if you wanted to be a political appointee as a Schedule C, a Schedule C is usually... GS-15 or below. So I know an individual, a few years ago, I was eating lunch with him. He was a political appointee and he was a GS-13 because he helped out with President Obama's campaign and he was able to get the 13. And then just a couple of years later, he, be, he was actually an SES and then he moved over to the, to the private side. So that's an option for a lot of people out there. About half of the Schedule C's they focus more on policy. So if, especially if you have policy experience, that could be something that interests you. All right. So next question is from user GK4Y01. He asked, how long does a top secret clearance take to receive? I've applied since last month and I have a very clean background. I never traveled except once. And I lived in the same neighborhood for 10 years. I have no foreign contacts. Give me an estimate. Okay, so for top secret uh, clearance, average processing time, it's four to six months, all right? So that's the average time in which you can expect to get a top secret. This can take up to a year. And if you look at job offer letters, some of them mention that if you do not receive your, your clearance within six months, they reserve the right to pull your job offer. So it is something serious. And... It's not just based on foreign travel. I mean, it can also depend upon your family, family members. What are they getting into? Finances is a big one. There's so, so many examples of where people 
committed espionage or became traitors, sold secrets to different countries solely for the money. So they're going to look at your finances. They're going to look at your credit score. Uh, international travel, you said you only traveled once. I would really keep it at that period, four to six months. All right. So next question is from MASH4690. If I'm a current federal employee and I've accepted another federal job within the same organization, how much time do I have to decide to go back to my first job? Okay. So this seems like an internal hire position. It's going to come down to agency policy and the leadership if they're going to let you move back. Usually when you get a new job, a new government job, a different position, they're going to have to cut another SF-50. And that SF-50 document is going to have your new, if you have a new job series, if you have a new GS grade, you know, it's going to have your, it's going to have the new position on there. So what I would do in your situation is probably reach it, reach back out to your previous supervisor and explore some of the possibilities of coming back. You know, that could be kind of difficult. It's going to depend upon your, your agency and your supervisor. All right, let's look at the chat. Aliyah Jones seems like most of, okay. Yeah, F FAA, a lot of them are in the accepted positions. And one thing I forgot to mention with the political appointee, all of those, you know, they serve at the pleasure of the president. All of those are accepted service positions. Just like non-competitive, any type of non-competitive hiring is going to fall under the accepted service. Okay, question from God's favor. Do you write resumes for clients or do you just supply the template? I'm new to your channel and haven't explored your services thoroughly yet. Well, God's favorite. Hey, thank you for, for finding my channel and sticking with it. So what I do, my, my intent is to teach individuals how to do it for themselves. I'm not a big proponent on writing 100% of anybody's resume, right? Not even a family member. <laughs> I want that individual to understand how to write it and put it together because you're you're going to keep getting new jobs more than likely. So at some point you're going to be you're going to have to be the one that updates, modifies, edits your resume. So what I do is I provide a lot of the the information, the knowledge, the instruction on how to do it. Now, after you have made an attempt, right? After you have tried your best to create it based on the guidance I give, I will edit it. I will give suggestions. I will comment on it. So that is something that I do. All right, let's get back to the questions. Oh, before, before doing that, there is another question that was asked just two days ago. All right, this revolves around area of consideration. So some people have been getting not referred or not eligible based on not meeting the area of consideration. So when you say that, when you read that phrase, area of consideration, most people think about like a physical location, like geography, <laughs> like an actual location. And that's not what it means. It doesn't mean you're outside of the commuting distance. It doesn't mean anything like that. Area of consideration means that you apply to a job announcement, but you didn't meet any of the hiring paths. So there's a who may apply area. And it, li it lists the job announcement, lists the hiring paths that are eligible to apply to that announcement. So if that announcement is only for internal hires in Schedule A disabled, if it's only for those two, and you know, you're a recent student graduate, or you're, you're just open to a public individual, and you try to apply for that, it doesn't matter how well qualified. You weren't, you're, you were not considered because you didn't meet the area of consideration. So that's what it means. And Simply put, it means you need to read the job announcement more thoroughly before you, you spend or waste the time in applying for a job announcement that's not for you. Pay attention to those hiring paths. Pay attention to the section of who may apply. Okay, so the next question is from John Ma, 1280. Do you think federal employees have better work-life balance compared to contractors? I've always noticed the government client is always stressed out, meeting milestones, and the contractor hardly shows up on site because the clients are too busy to actually task the contractors. <clears throat> so I would say in my experience that contractors, um, they're more on the technical side. So the federal government employee, they're the, they're the customer. It's their responsibility to utilize the contractors 
in order to, to help facilitate or to help get a lot of the work done. And the federal government employee is always going to be the individual that's ultimately responsible for what's going on. But I would say that the government employee probably has a little bit better work-life balance. This is dependent on the office, the agency, your supervisor, your leadership, and everything else. But on average, I would say a federal government employee has more work-life balance. For one thing, I, I believe that the government employees, they have certain days off and they get they receive, you know, two, three hours off here and there where the contractor doesn't necessarily get that same type of treatment. And you have that job security. You have that stability that allows you to, um, to make different decisions, which I think lends to a greater work-life balance. It's going to depend. Um, but yeah. And, you know, talking about work-life balance, I know a lot of people have heard about the new directive that came out from o OMB regarding remote work. So there's this, there's this idea, there's an impression that everyone's going to be rushing back into the office. And the main language that was used in this directive, all the, all the executive cabinets, all the cabinet members received it, the secretaries, you know, most of the leadership from all federal agencies, they received this directive. And the main language that people are highlighting is, the expectation to increase meaningful in-person work while still using flexible operational policies. So that's it right there. Increase meaningful in-person work. So a lot of things haven't changed overnight or over one week from the next. But I know there's a lot of, of senior executives that are eager to get people back into the office. Also, by that same token, there have been positions that were in office before the pandemic and they've realized, hey, this can be done offsite. So they have actually converted some positions to 100% remote. So um, both things are happening. I do think that telework in some capacity is here to stay in the future. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the chat. All right. Okay, let's go to the next question. Next question is from Do Dog God Doggo Dango 3232. I'm currently a WG DOD employee and I plan to convert to a GS position. Do you happen to know any resources from converting WG to GS? So, you know, I would apply to job announcements that match your experience. Now, if your salary expectations are of concern, one way to do it, one way to gauge how you can uh, make the transition is take your hourly wage and then compare it to a GS grade. Don't take the locality pay out of it. So in the DC, there's like a 30, 33% locality pay. Take that out of it. Look at it. You know, if you're a, w, uh, I know a, w, a WG10 that recently transitioned to GS11 because he met the specialized experience. It matched his experience, so he was able to do that. So um, you'll hear a lot of stories like that. And what I would encourage you to do is look at where you have experience at. Like, I'm not sure. I, I would need a little bit more context on what you did as a WG DOD employee. But there's probably something out on the GS side. So definitely look into that. Next question we have is from D. Mitchell who ask if I have over 30 years of work experience and a master degree, would I have to start in the government as a GS9? Could I try for a GS11 or 12? So <laughs> once again, this comes down to your experience. 30 plus years could qualify you for a GS15 or an SES, or maybe it's a GS11. I don't know what you did in those 30 years, but you can qualify just solely based on experience. A lot of government jobs, they do not have an educational requirement. And people get kind of mixed up about this because you will always see job announcements that say GS11. To qualify on education, you need a PhD. <laughs> That's what it says, and it scares people, and I get it. That is only to qualify solely on education. And most people have experience. Even if you just got out of university, if you just came out of university, you have experience. If you volunteered, you worked a minimum wage job, that's still experience. So I would not look at just qualifying solely on education. You would do it on experience. Now, there are some government jobs that require certain degrees. 
like uh, obviously in the medical field, um, some in the finance field, some in the IT field, some IT jobs prefer that you have a bachelor's in computer science or something like that. It's a preference. It's not a requirement. Read the entire job announcement. Um, but for me to give you my honest thought on your situation, you know, I have to, I would have to have your resume in front of me. I would have to know your location, what job series you're targeting. And if you're, what, how relevant is your experience to the job series you're targeting? All of those things. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that larger cities, they're, they're heavy on the GS grade side. So let me give you a quick example. If you go to Ohio, go to Ohio, go to Iowa, go to Indiana, in the rural area, a GS 11 out in the rural area, that same person is probably doing the same thing a GS 13 is doing in Washington, D.C. or New York City or San Francisco. So there is grade creep in the cities. And the reason for that, I know it doesn't seem fair. The reason for that is they have to create some sort of incentive for people to work in a major city. And in a major city, you're competing with other major companies that are willing to pay a lot more. So that's why you'll see some of that, that GS grades. You'll see them higher in a metropolitan area. And you'll see for the same responsibility, for the most part, you'll see it lower in the rural area. All right, let's take a look at the chat. Jake is not a fan of contracting work. Good morning, KK. All right. Hey, also, if you have a question to help me to help me sort through this out, put a capital Q in front of your question so I can easily see it in the chat. Thank, thank you, everybody, for being here again, and we'll get right back into the questions. Next question is from D. Mitchell, who asks, do you think the federal government will eventually go back into the office or will they still hire for remote jobs? So I think I touched on this a little earlier, but once again, I think there'll always be a place for telework and also for 100% remote work, right? For the right person in the right position, it's a win-win for both the agency and the individual. The individual it grants a lot of freedom. And for the agency, you know, there's no, there's less overhead expenses. Now, not everybody wants a remote work position, but I think the majority do. And that's evident when you go and apply for a remote work position, you can filter it on USA Jobs. And if you search, I think right now there's, I searched, I ran a search yesterday. There's over 500 positions for remote only. 570, 100% remote work positions. And you can, you know, start applying for those today. This number has been kind of steady over the last five or six months. The, the remote work filter, the 100% remote work filter, that just came out like 12 months ago or less than 12 months ago. So that's kind of new. But since, it's, since it has, um, since it's been implemented into usajobs.gov, the average I see is between 300 and 600 remote work jobs. Any given day, 300 to 600. A lot of them are in the 0, 0300 series. Some of them are in the 2210 series. Now, the requirement for remote work is that you have to be in the United States. You cannot, you cannot go to Belize or Costa Rica and try to work a remote work position. Or Spain or Europe. You're not supposed to do that. To do that, there is a way, right? There is um, a process to try to do that. You would have to go to the Department of State and get an exemption in order to work outside of the United States in a remote work position. I know a lot of people were trying to go to Mexico during the pandemic and work there. And they feel like, you know, as long as I got a VPN, I should be good. That's not always the case. Um, so, yes, I do think that there's an effort right now, politically speaking, to kind of to, to return people more into the office. But I don't think we're going back from 100% remote work. There, there are positions that are that are properly suited for that, that there's no business, no reason that they actually need to be in the office. But the, the reason why I feel that they're pulling people back in, a lot of uh, economy, local economies in cities have been devastated because the employees are not around. Talk, talk about D.C., for example. The mayor of D.C. has asked the government time and time again they have asked and pretty much pleaded trying to get federal employees back because their restaurants are suffering. The small businesses are suffering. The convenience stores are suffering because when you have tens of thousands of government employees in D.C., they're eating at restaurants. They're buying, you know, they're going to the dry cleaner. They're buying, they're picking this up. 
they're doing a lot of spending money down there. And it hasn't been like that for the last two or three years. So a lot of these small businesses, if you walk down to DC, you see some of them going out of business, they're shuttering their doors. There's been a huge outcry trying to get those employees back to get that money circulating back in DC. That, that plays a huge role as well. Okay, next question from you to Sami, who asks, does negotiating pay ever cause the employer to remove you from the job offer or position? Uh, also, in regard with not being able to negotiate GS level, I'm confused on what it means that through VRA, VEOA, veterans can get a GS-11 without competition. Okay, can negotiating pay result in an employer or the agency pulling the job offer? Yes, it can. <laughs> it's always a risk. But for the most time, I would say probably 95% of the time, they're not going to pull the job offer when you, when you initially try to negotiate. And you can do that by submitting a memo showing that you're superiorly qualified or by showing a pay stub or an earning statement from your previous employer showing that you were earning more money and asking to be matched on a certain step level. So if you if you have a GS-11 offer, but you're making $20,000 more than a step one, you can show the proof, show them your, you know, email the earning statement and then request to get a step seven or something like that. Now, if they say, okay, you asked for a step seven and they come back and say, hey, the best we can do is step three. Now, if you want to do it again, if you want to try to negotiate again, I think the probability is higher that they will pull your job offer. Now, if there's no one else, and if you have a highly de desirable skill and there's no one else waiting, they might continue to negotiate with you, but I personally wouldn't risk it unless you're prepared to walk away. Now, for your second question, um, VR, okay. It says, um, I'm confused. So with the GS grade, you're not able to negotiate your GS grade level. You're only able to negotiate your step level. Now, when you speak about, you're confused about VRA and VEOA to get a GS 11 without competition. So <clears throat> let me explain it. V, VRA is for veterans that have a campaign, that have a campaign medal. And that means that or, or they're disabled. That means they can non-competitively be placed up to a GS-11. And the way that that would work normally, you go through your coordinator. You go through a veteran coordinator at the agency. And you could do that through fedshiervets.gov. You go to that website, you click on agency directory, and you email those folks underneath the agency. You can email them your supporting documentation, which means your DD-214, your resume, and your SF-15 if you have one. And then they can identify a role within their agency and they can place you up to a GS-11 non-competitively. This works out for the agency too because <clears throat> non-competitive hiring is, like I mentioned, it's, it's a accepted service, meaning that they can do it a lot quicker. They don't have to advertise it on USA Jobs, go through the structure hiring process, so it's kind of a win-win for the veteran. It's also kind of, it, it's a win for the agency because it reduces the time to hire an individual. That's what VRA is. Now, VEOA is something different. VEOA means that you have, you've completed three years in the military. You received an honorable discharge. And it means that you can apply to competitive service jobs. You are eligible to apply for competitive service jobs because you're giving that same you're given that same preference because of your military service. So you do not you do not need a campaign medal, and also you're not going to be appointed. It doesn't matter GS eleven. You can apply for a GS fifteen, but you have you're in the, you're not you're not restricted to open to the public. You can now enter into the competitive service and apply for one of those jobs. So that's what it means. Um, and I've known people that have taken advantage of VRA. And they, it doesn't mean that you're going to get a GS-11. They could give you a GS-9. They can offer you a GS-9 with a ladder to 11. So that's also a possibility. All right, let's see. All right. Question. Why do some job openings have a longer hiring period? Um, so... That was asked by Ab Gurung. I probably messed up your name. Sorry about that. So the, the hiring period, if you're talking about how long the job announcement is open, that's talked with with the agency. 
So that could be the longer that you have it open, um, you have more time to fill the position or you're looking for someone that's more highly specialized. If you have a shorter window, a lot of people are of the opinion that if the window is super short, they already have someone in mind. And that could be true. But it, it doesn't. it's not always true. So I would still apply for those positions. You'll see one that says uh, application or job announcement closes after the first 25 applicants. You're like, 25? <laughs> in the back of your head, a lot of people are like, oh, they already know who they want. I would still apply because that doesn't always mean that. There could be an urgent, um, an urgent need to have someone in that position. So they will have a shorter time period. But regardless, if it has a limit, like the top 20 or the first 25 or the first 50 applicants, still apply for those. If it's only five days, apply for those. Some of them are two weeks, three weeks. Some of them go up to 12 months. The roster positions, they go out to 12 months. Apply for those too. Apply for all of them. Now, when it comes to the, the, the job announcements that say only the top 25 applicants are going to be considered, here's something that you should know. When you apply for one of those job announcements, say it, it only wants the top 100, the first 100, and after that, the job announcement closes, you apply as soon as it opens. Maybe you're number 10, or maybe you're number five, I don't know. But then you decide, oh, wait, there's something on my resume I want to edit. I want to change something around. So you go back and you edit your application. When you do that, you go to the bottom of the list. You don't, you don't keep your spot. You're not number five anymore. <laughs> you're not number 10 anymore. So you can actually edit your application after a few hours and then 25, 50, 100 people already applied and then you're out of luck, right? So that's something that you need to consider when you're editing your application. And for the resumes, most people should know that you can upload up to five federal resumes into usajobs.gov. I would, I would um, have a resume for every job series and that way you only have to do minor uh, tailoring, minor adjustments before you're applying to jobs. So something worth considering. Okay, let's see if we have any more questions. God's favorite question. I've read where some people have received job offers without an interview through DHR. Does this really happen? God's favorite, yes, it actually happens. I would say it probably happens every single day. But where this is happening, it's usually below GS-11. So when you're when you're hiring more of the entry, entry level, let's say GS5, GS6, GS7, even GS9, there are times where they just want someone in. They don't even want to interview them. They look at their resume based on the strength and merit of their resume. They'll make a decision and extend a tentative job offer. So that does happen. And it confuses some people. <laughs> there was another person I was talking to the other day and they were like, I'm already doing the background. I'm doing the security information, but I haven't had the interview yet. And I was like, listen, you probably don't have an interview coming, but go ahead and email your point of contact and ask them just to make sure. And it turns out there was no interview. They just hired off of the, off of the resume. Okay, question from Tierra. Hi, Armand. Can you please do a video on the difference between GS salary and AD salary, benefits, pension, which is better, DHS or DOJ? Um, I can try to do a, a, a video breaking down more of the different pay pay bands. There's a lot of different pay bands. There's NH, there's GG, there's GS, there's AD. So I can try to put something like that together. It's going to take me a little time, but I will, I'll write that down. I'll write that suggestion down and I'll see if I can work on that later. Now, when it comes to agency, where I would go is better places, better placed, I'm, I'm messing this up, betterplacetowork.org. There's a website that exist every year, they rate the federal agencies. And they do this by surveying the actual employees. And um, you know, every year I have to fill out one of these surveys as well. But they rate them on so many different points. It gives you an idea, like they show innovation, leadership, employee satisfaction, all customer service, all of this stuff. They have that information out there. And you mentioned DHS, and I hate to say this, but DHS ranks last for large agencies, Last year, they were dead last. A lot of people, DHS is huge though, right? DHS has so many agencies underneath it, um, including FEMA, Border Patrol, Immigration. So, um, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't let that deter you from applying, but take a look at it. And, and then you can also probably break it down to sub-agency as well if you want some data and information on that. 
In fact, I think the the new list probably comes out in June. So in a couple of months, I'll, as soon as that list drops, I'm going to make a video on that. I made a video last year. If you look at last June, July, I made a video covering the rankings of the top five best and the top five worst agencies that they have out there based on that survey. Um, all right. Do we have any more questions? Uh, okay, we have one from Zella. A, if you have a question, please put a capital Q next to your question so I can identify it in the chat. The question from Zilla, uh, Zola, excuse me, Zola. How, how can I join government or government contracting job here in the U.S. or abroad? I became a U.S. citizen recently. Congratulations for that. I have a couple of years experience in the IT industry. All right, so... Um, the way that you get a government job, you have to get on US, usajobs.gov, create an account, upload a resume, create a job filter, and then start searching and applying for jobs. If you want to know how to do that, I have a video on how to set up a USA Jobs account. I have a video on how to set up a job filter. So look at those videos. You say you have a couple of years in the IT industry. So if you want to focus on IT, that's the 2210 job series. And that's one that's desperately in need. I was talking to someone the other day that they offered him a relocation incentive to move to California because that's how bad they wanted they wanted um, they wanted to hire a 2210. 2210's in high demand. So, you know, if your resume is written in a relevant, strong fashion, you can start competing for a lot of these jobs. It it just matters if you're a US citizen. It's a binary. It's either yes, no. And in your case, it's yes. So you're eligible, I would start applying. Okay. Um, okay, let's switch over. Let's see what else we got here. Okay. Oh, you know, I was looking the other day. Um, I go through governmentexecutive.com. It's a news website. And I saw an article there that was saying that more and more parents are not recommending a government job or a government career to their kids. Now, you know, when you have kids in the household, they start getting old and into high school years, they become a teenager. And you're giving them guidance, like maybe you should join the military, maybe you should pursue law or medicine or whatever it is. And less people over a 20-year period, less parents are actually recommending government. And this is evident with the low amount of young people we have in the government. If you look at the federal government and you look at the private sector, look at their ages. The average age is a lot higher in the government. Young people either do not know or do not care about getting into the government. Now, uh, 60% total of parents, they either said, do not get a government job, or I don't know about that. That might not be the right decision. Now, of course, politics played a role into this, um, where the data suggests that 56% of Democrats said yes to a career in government, and 62% of Republicans said no. And if you know about the politics in this country, usually Republicans are for smaller government, less government spending, and uh, Democrats are for more social programs and a little bit more government spending. But what's interesting about that, if you look at the last 15 to 20 years in the government, we have had Democratic presidents, we have had Republican presidents. And despite what party is in office, the number stayed the same for government employees. It has been 2.1 million give or take a few, 2.1 million over the last 15 to 20 years. And it didn't matter if it was Donald Trump in office, if it was President Obama in office, if it was President Bush, it didn't matter who was in. Now, certain presidents might target certain agencies. Like I think under Trump, I think the EPA was reduced, right? But then DOD was increased. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people are worried when we have a new president come in, if uh, their government job is in jeopardy or, or or things like that. So I thought that was worth discussing. Let's see. Another question. Are there any, uh, this is from Allah Jones. Are there any government contractors you are familiar with in the Southeast region? You know, if you're interested in contracting, I've actually done a few videos on contracting. I've done one on Booz and Allen, and I've done one on uh, Lidos. 
a good start for you if you're interested in contracting is to Google the top 10 the top 10 defense contractors and you'll see a lot of names up there. You know, focus in on the top three or the top four and then go to their actual website and search it. And there you will find the job listings. It's all over the country. It's not just in the DC area. It's not just on the West Coast. It's everywhere. So I would encourage you to search on that website. Also, if you have a security clearance, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> if you have a security clearance, go to clearancejobs.com. And I'll try to leave a link in the description below. If you're interested, you go there, you can upload your resume. There are some aggressive recruiters in the contracting space, especially if you have a IT background or you have an intelligence background. If you have one of those backgrounds, there are some aggressive recruiters out there that will contact you. And if you're not having luck on there, get on LinkedIn and look for, for individuals that have recruiter in their title. So um, Booz and Allen, you can search on LinkedIn, Booz and Allen, recruiter, and you can find a senior recruiter, a technical recruiter, shoot them a message. There's, They're more than happy to respond to you. And if they can't help you, they'll probably redirect you to somebody that can help you. All right. Um, Tierra says, I have a tentative job offer with ICE. Well, congratulations on that. And then I also have an interview with DOJ. Yeah, I mean, when it comes, you know, you have multiple interviews, could result in multiple job offers. I would accept all of them. Someone asked me another question. Can you accept more than one job offer? Absolutely. You can accept all of them. <laughs> there was a time I had accepted four job offers simultaneously. You can accept multiple tentatives and you can accept even multiple final job offers. And one of the reasons why you would do that is because sometimes with a tentative, sometimes um, the security team is taking too long. So it can result in you starting working one or two months earlier. Or another reason is if you enter into negotiations, like step negotiations, maybe DOJ is willing to give you step eight and then uh, DHS is not willing to give you anything past step one. So in that case, if money is the deciding factor, you would go with DOJ. So there's a lot of good reasons why you would accept multiple job offers. And don't feel bad about backing out of a job offer. They usually have number two and number three already identified. It's nothing personal and everyone understands that you're doing what's in your best interest, right? So that's something that I try to emphasize to people that uh, they feel bad, right? Because they'll accept a tentative job offer and then at the last minute, they're like, oh no, I didn't want that. I want the other one. <laughs> There's people who have accepted tentative job offer, a final job offer, and they actually show up to their office and they shake hands with their supervisor. Three days later, they're in a different agency and that's possible too. All right, so okay, another thing that I wanted to bring up to everybody, if there's any kind of videos that you think would help you in your situation, let me know in the comments down below. You can enter it in the chat right now. The chat is going to be replayable for everybody who watches this on the replay, but you can drop a comment, you can email me. So what I found out is recently that more people find the when I do a video on people's experience, like this is my experience working in the DOD, or this is my experience working at the USDA. They find that video more valuable because it gives them a little bit more insight on what to expect if they were to accept a job offer at that agency. So I found that those videos have been doing pretty good. If you have any other ideas for other videos, you know, I'd be, I'd be, uh, really would like to know. Um, let's see. We don't have anything else left in the chat. All right, let's start to wrap up this stream. Hey, I thank everybody for being here. I really appreciate the support. It means a lot. Um, if you need more, if you need more support, if you need more help, um, I mean, you know, search through the videos. There's probably a topic there. I think I have like 250 videos now. So you can search through, use the search function and see if anything um, in there might help you in your particular circumstance. A lot of times when people ask me, can I get this GS grade? Can I get that? I can't really... I can't make those, um, I can't give you that insight without actually looking at your resume. And in doing that with resume help, if you want, if you want an example on how a, a good style, a good format, a well-written resume, um, there's a link in the description to, you can download, um, 
you can download a resume template that's built already. I have one for 0343 and I have one for 0340. 0343 is management and program analyst. 0340 is program management. So if either one of those job series interests you and you're curious on how a strong one looks like, you know, feel free, go down there, check out that link. You can download it. I also have one for 2210, which is an IT specialist. With 2210 series, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of difference because you have actual software and application developers, and then you have more of a generic IT specialist. So the resume that I wrote was more for an IT specialist. You can check that out. You can always book a call with me down below. You can check out the course if you'd like. I also just recently started a newsletter. So once a month, my intention is once a month to submit a newsletter. You can sign up below for free. Just put your email address in there. And I'll you know, try to include some of the current events that are occurring with government jobs, also some strategies for applying for a government job, strategies for you know, getting the interview taken care of, negotiating your job offer, everything like that. So I just started that out, pretty excited about it. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Please like, let me check the comments one more time. Please hit the like button, definitely. Would appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Any more questions? Thanks for your consultation. I got three interviews. That's great, Star Child 42. Hey, good luck on those three interviews. Uh, I have some really good videos on interviews, so check those out too. I think that'll really help help you prepare for them. Uh, do you review resumes? I will, New Wave 2239, I will review a resume. If you schedule a call, send your resume Send your resume to me, schedule a call, and I'll review it in its entirety and give you my thoughts on your resume. So with that being said, hey, please hit like, please share. If you haven't subscribed already, please click su subscribe. Thank you all once again for watching. You know, if it wasn't for you, then I would just be here talking to myself. So I really appreciate everyone coming and I will see you in the next one.